Welcome to the Big House Bleachers podcast, proud member of the Block M podcast network, brought to you by Fans First Sports. I'm Michael Smeltzer. I am here, as always, with Big House Bleachers co-host, Matt Hartwell. Matt, how you doing, man? I know you just got done watching that Michigan basketball game, right? Unfortunately, Mike. I mean, <laughs> I... Uh, and. I, I was totally wrong. I thought that this was the last basketball game of the regular season. No, wrong again. Michigan plays Nebraska next week. So, you know, I thought we were kind of out of the woods after uh, this weekend. But lo and behold, we're in for another uh, weekend of misery with Mich- Michigan basketball. All Probably all things considered next week as well. Well... Is that really a regular season game? I assumed when I saw that 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 was the Big Ten tournament, but I don't know. As far as basketball goes, I'm so uh, out of the loop right now. I'm a diehard Michigan basketball fan, but it's been so hard to get excited about this team. We're going to talk about some controversial stuff as it relates to Michigan basketball here shortly, but uh, let's run through some quick hitters in the news, and then, of course, we got to talk about the NFL draft combine. I mean, that's... That's what we're talking about as Michigan fans right now. We've got 18 representatives at the NFL Draft Combine, uh, not to mention some guys that used to play for Michigan that are uh, eligible for the NFL Draft. So a lot of really cool stuff going on. Um, But first, in the news, it was announced that uh, college football is expected to at least consider – I I can't remember if they've actually pushed this through already or not, but they are expected to – adopt helmet communication and sideline tablets and all i got to say as a michigan man is you're welcome you're welcome everybody because we caused this <laughs> there no more no more signs no more signs to steal no more binoculars or iphones from the stands uh matt do you think this is a good change or a bad change for college football This is absolutely a good change, Mike. And, you know, I totally am piggybacking off of the you're welcome you just dished to the listener base. I mean, this is something that uh, college football has been behind the times on for quite some some time. So this uh, this really just comes obviously on the heels of all of the, the sign gate shenanigans and drama following following that for Michigan. But, you know. I think that it's it's all a due occurrence as far as college football goes. You know, it's something that's been needed for quite some time, and now uh, college athletics is is modernizing itself to fit that. So you're welcome. You know, the only reason it's a bad change is because I'm really gonna miss having four dudes on an opponent sideline dressed like Teletubbies holding up a picture of. Kermit the Frog, Barack Obama, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and some obscure painting from the 18th century, and trying to figure out which one of those is the actual play, you know? Like, that that was one of the weirdest, most creative uh, things that evolved out of this no-helmet communication, uh, signal, sign, college football situation. But yeah, I think we all agree. Um, adopting helmet communication is a good thing. Adopting sideline tablets is a good thing. I mean, we it it's even Division two teams can afford this stuff now. It's not. I mean, the the essence of the rule is is outdated. But then they slid in a third rule change, and I don't know if you saw this. They talked about adding a two minute warning to college football, which I'm not sure how I feel about that. I always kind of appreciate the two minute warning because it makes comebacks a little bit more realistic or likely, but it does feel like a money grab, right? They're like, no, 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 this is for the betterment of the game. And it's like, are you sure it's not for the extra commercial break? <laughs> you know, it kind of kind of seems like it's for that extra commercial break, but I don't know. I'm open to the two minute warning. How do you feel about it? It certainly is interesting, you know, as somebody that watches both, you know, professional football and college football, I've always found myself kind of wondering in certain instances, uh, you know, what if there was a two-minute warning here in this game, you know? uh, How much could that impact, you know, some of these other games that I've watched over the last 
several years of my fandom and uh it, it i don't know it presents an interesting dynamic in my opinion it's not something that i'm so turned off about it's more of kind of a uh kind of a wait and see thing for me as to how far it'll impact some of these some of these games and some of these matchups agreed all the way around uh you know college football is changing times are changing there's no stopping the locomotive uh we shall see i think most of the changes are for the better uh do you want to talk about michigan basketball not at all nor do i <laughs> but, but let's <laughs> talk about some of the controversy right we don't need to talk about the actual basketball but let's talk about the there's there's been a little bit of controversy in the news um so uh, Sanderson from Camp Sanderson, the strength and conditioning coach of Michigan basketball, the guy that, I mean, you see b before and after photos of Isaiah Livers and Jordan Poole and Karis Levert. And, you know, these guys that are scrawny coming into Michigan under John Beeline, and they leave looking like stacked NBA players and uh, very similar to kind of the Ben Herbert-esque situation going on in the football program. Well, uh, John Sanderson, is that his first name? John, did I get that right? Camp, yeah. Camp Sanderson, yeah, John Sanderson, um, longtime strength and conditioning coach. He's uh, one of those guys that has been around. Uh, he predates Jawan. You know, he was there for the B line years. He's been there forever. Um, he stepped away. He stepped away from the team. Um, they've officially parted ways with Sanderson, and then the the story starts to trickle out about what actually happened. We knew there was a confrontation between him and Jawan Howard. And I want to lead this by saying, I have no idea what actually happened. I don't know who was right and who was wrong, but I can tell you what the optics look like. So you've got Jawan Howard, who is a guy that was on this zero tolerance for aggressive behavior for literally slapping an opponent's coach, right? Which I, I think as Michigan fans, most of us are like, ah, that's not a good look, but we're okay with it. We're like, okay, you know, the Wisconsin guys kind of pissed us off too. Like, all right, he threw a slap. He shouldn't have done that. Well, he's on this zero aggression policy, and we knew earlier in the year there was an incident in the locker room or training room or wherever um, that involved John Sanderson and Jawan Howard. And uh, the details as it stands uh, in a story that was reported by The Athletic earlier this week is that Jace Howard, Jawan's son, again, another guy I love and respect, but the, I mean, I'm just reporting the story as it was written, uh, was being disrespectful to a member of the Michigan basketball training staff. He was, uh, I think the word they used was he was berating a member of the training staff. Uh, John Sanderson from reportedly 30 feet away, so across the room, uh, basically told Jace, you're a student athlete. That's a professional. Have some respect. Don't don't treat him that way. Quit acting so entitled. Um, apparently, Jawan Howard from like the hallway or around the corner kind of catches wind of the commotion, and uh, you can almost imagine what you know. He had to be held back from players and coaches were holding him back. He was trying to fight Sanderson. Uh, all of this happened. There was an HR report. Ward Manual said. Uh, we're going to thoroughly investigate this situation. Uh, now, apparently, they gave Sanderson an opportunity to step away from the team and work uh, with some of the Olympic athletes uh, over at Michigan. And uh, Sanderson had one request. He said, if you guys are going to report my a my absence, don't say that it's voluntary because it's not voluntary. You guys are making me step away. Well, if you remember when he stepped away, all we heard was that it was voluntary, right? Like it, we basically heard that he was choosing to step away from the program, which apparently was not true and it was not what he wished the messaging around this scenario to be. Long story short, Ward Manual completes this HR investigation, if there even was one. You know, he com completed this HR investigation and says they found no fault for Juwan Howard, no further disciplinary action. And uh, Michigan goes on to have the worst season they've ever had in the history of Michigan basketball under Juwan. Uh, Sanderson's nowhere to be found. At the end of the year, he steps away. When it when it starts to feel like Ward Manuel's going to give Juwan Howard another year, Sanderson leaves. And then, um, so let me pause here. That's a lot of information to digest. Uh, Matt, you know, 
it's kind of hard to view this any other way than Jawan lost his cool again. The administration is not handling it properly. And Michigan Athletics loses another really talented, amazing coach. I mean, that that's the way I see it. How do you see it? Well, you know how I see it, Mike. And, you know, keep in mind, I take the recent you know, release of the story or whatever you call it with a little bit of a grain of salt, just because given the the timing of Sanderson's absence, you would be inclined to believe that this recollection of the story is probably coming from Sanderson, right? So not to diminish any anything about Sanderson's word or like how truthful that is. I'm just mindful that, you know, this part of the story, the, this whatever the Athletic published, is probably trickled out from Sanderson's point of view. So keeping that in mind, if the story played out exactly, you know, as it was told, and Sanderson was indeed, you know, just sticking up for a mem- for a member of Michigan's training staff, you know, I think that it's it's completely just unacceptable behavior to that's being allowed from Michigan's point of view. You know what I mean? Because there's nothing right about a student athlete, you know, berating or undermining the authority of a member of Michigan's training staff, period. You know, they're there to do a job. They're there to lead and instruct these student athletes and and make them the best possible versions of themselves so at the end of the day like they're just trying to do a job sanderson and from his perspective is just trying to have some defense from them for them doing their job and then you have more evidence of Jawan howard you know acting out of what would be viewed as the right way to handle the situation by coming at Sanderson in aid of his son or a member of his team or whatever it be have you. I just think, you know, it it all starts from a cultural perspective. You want these types of things to be in check whenever you want your basketball team to be performing as best as it possibly could be on the court, just in general. So getting these kinds of things and this kind of behavior under control is really like the first building block that Michigan should have in mind in trying to reshape these problems that it has currently with its basketball team. So I think for Michigan to come out as soon as they did and say, you know, like Jawan Howard is completely absolved of any wrongdoing. Let's continue with business as usual. I think that that just kind of completely sweeps under the rug this larger issue, you know, that's taking part within the basketball program that Ward Manuel and the university and the athletic department have the opportunity to kind of step in and and intervene in that situation. You know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but instead of just kind of, you know, just sweep, we're going to have Juwan's back in no matter what. You know, I I don't know. I just think that the whole thing kind of paints a picture of just an even larger thing that's wrong with the basketball program. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. At the end of the day, you hate to see a guy like Sanderson walk out the door. He was obviously a part of John Beeline's staff, the success that he had coaching at the University of Michigan. So, that's something that Michigan fans, you know, they want to hang on to these days as much as possible. So really the last thing that you want to see as a fan or follower of the Michigan basketball program is a long tenured member of that staff walking out the door, Mike. Well, I agree with you that a lot of the details we're getting is probably from the Sanderson perspective. Uh, My understanding is that he had to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, but I don't know the legality of that or if he can leak out information or not. Um, so it is probably coming from Sanderson's camp, no pun intended there. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing about that is you have to give Sanderson the benefit of the doubt because he's been there for years and years and years without incident. And you, it's kind of hard to give Jawan Howard the benefit of the doubt because 
like the same week that all of this was going on, he went out to the Bahamas and got thrown out of a game that he wasn't even the coach of. You, you remember that? Was I think that was in the Bahamas, but it, it was early in the season. He he got tossed from a game where he wasn't even the head coach, and so he's losing his cool on the sidelines. There's been numerous incidents where Jawan has publicly been seen losing his cool. And, I mean, we're not talking about, like, you know, like, I, I get that losing your cool, like there's the Bobby Knights of the world, the even the Tom Izzo's of the world that lose their cool. But, like, I feel like once you take a swing at another coach, like you lose – the benefit of the doubt in these situations where the details are a little gray and we don't know who to believe. It's like, well, based on the evidence that we have publicly, it it completely makes sense that Jawan lost his temper and was having to be held back and tried to fight another grown man uh, at this training facility. So interesting thought exercise before we move on to football, because we're going to get to football. I promise you listeners, we're going to talk about football, a lot of good stuff. Um, if Michigan was 30 and 3 and was number 1 a number 1 seed in Joe Lenardi's bracketology right now would you view this incident a little bit differently Absolutely Mike as in fact I was just <laughs> thinking you know uh recollecting on other pods uh what exactly our our viewpoint was a year ago when Jawan Howard got in that scuffle and you know all the times that we've defended him when basketball team was having success well you know now it's not it's not looking so sunny on the other end so uh that certainly is a an interesting an interesting thing to point out but you know at the mm -hmm. end of the day it, it's it's all been kind of slowly careening off on this uncontrollable path for michigan basketball and these are the kind of things that you have to look at when the train is off the tracks so I mean, it's so when, bad. It's when, yeah, you know, it, we can't look at Jawan and say, oh, he's acting like a total badass defending his team when they're winning games. You know, it's it's a little bit of a different story when Michigan's having a, a terrible season and he's acting, you know, very much not in a positive light. So, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting tidbit there. Well, I mentioned Bobby Knight a second ago, and there's a reason Bobby Knight was able to keep coaching after he threw a chair across the basketball court. It's because he was winning a hell of a lot of games, you know? <laughs> like, when you win games, you just, you kind of get the benefit of the doubt in these situations. Jawan Howard, I mean, it's been an abysmal season. Now, I'm not giving up on him. If he if he's the coach, he's the coach. I love Jawan. He's a Michigan legend. He's a Michigan legend. I will say this. If I was the athletic director, knowing what I know, you know, maybe there's maybe Ward Manuel knows more than we do, and I'm open to that. But if I was the athletic director right now, I'd be looking to make a change, and that's just me. Um, I say that I say that with complete respect for everything that Jawan Howard has done. I think the Fab Five banners should hang in the rafters. I think his AP Coach of the Year award as a coach was incredible. I love him. I support him. But I'd be looking to make a change. Um, that's enough basketball for this episode. Let's go ahead and talk about the 18 players in the NFL Draft Combine. We're not going to touch on all 18, but we've got a list of a few notable guys that have performed and participated in some drills at the Combine. Let's start with our leader, our Lord and Savior, J.J. McCarthy. Here's what he had to say about his performance at the Combine. So J.J. admitted that he wanted to have a few things back, a few throws back. He said the shuttle was a little embarrassing. But uh, overall, uh, what's your assessment of J.J.'s performance in the NFL Draft Combine? I, I got some Buckeyes in my mentions telling me he's the worst quarterback that ever lived. <laughs> well, you know, Mike, that's certainly not my takeaway from it. You know, if anything, uh, I, I feel like J.J. stayed right exactly where he was in my mind in terms of NFL draft stock, right? I don't think that he did anything necessarily that, you know, we didn't already know that he's capable of. And at the same time, he also made some mistakes that we completely know that he's capable of making, right? He excelled in the intermediate game. He, uh, you know, missed on a couple. He missed on a couple of deep shots. 
Uh, he connected on a couple of deep shots. But, you know, all in all, all things considered, I think that he's still securely viewed in my mind and in everybody else's mind as probably the fourth best quarterback uh, or prospect in this draft. And I still think that he's going to probably go mid to, you know, probably mid to early late-ish first round. And uh, and (laughs) mid to early late-ish. You kind of covered, kind of covered the whole first round there, didn't you? (laughs) I mean, I don't think he's sliding all the way to like, you know, super late in that first round. I think that he's going to get picked up, you know, (laughs) probably middle-ish, maybe a little bit after somewhere in that realm but uh, he's top 16 he I, i'm yeah. gonna i'm gonna hold firm i'm gonna hold firm i, I think he's top 16 you look at the teams there's been some cra- uh, crazy things out there there's rumors that he moved all the way up to the top five and then there you know i i could see him going top 10 now like he jj made a big move when the nfl scouts started to really evaluate the tape and they started looking at his ability and his efficiency per play, and they started to realize, oh, this guy is as good as Caleb Williams, Michael Penix, Jaden Daniels, those guys. You know, like he actually is. But I agree with your assessment. I don't think he necessarily helped himself at the combine, but he did well enough to where I don't think he hurt himself either. He he looked a little shaky at times, but uh, made some really impressive throws, and then made a couple throws it was like ah shit you know that was off and it's hard to know like what you know he doesn't have his receivers well actually he threw a couple to Cornelius Johnson so he did have one of his receivers but um and it was interesting that one to Cornelius that I saw was like the purest throw and catch and it was like oh that's his guy you know he just hit him and so I think JJ's the kind of guy when the lights are at their brightest when the games are the biggest when there's a defense on the field and when a play needs to be made, JJ's going to make you a play. And a lot of what makes him great is when the play breaks down and he's able to scramble. He's one of the most efficient passers uh, on the run. And you just don't get to see that in an NFL combine. And so I think the scouts are seeing that when they look at the at the tape. Um, the, I just would have loved to see him run a 40-yard dash. We've been We've heard rumbles out of camp the last couple of years that he's like one of the fastest quarterbacks in the country. And, uh, he, qu- he quoted hammy tightness as the reason he didn't run his 40. I think it's more just, you know, quarterbacks don't want to run their forties that, uh, the dude, Sam, Sam Hartman from Notre Dame was the only one that ran a 40. Did you happen to see that? Did you watch that at all, Matt? I didn't catch it. What, what, what do you mean? He was the only quarterback that ran a 40-yard dash, and something about him is just hilarious. He had the big Fabio hair going on and the full beard, and he's like, I don't know, he's like 38 years old or some shit. Like the dude, it was just, it was just kind of a funny uh, situation watching it. But I agree, JJ didn't hurt himself. Um, another guy that let's let's I be th- honest, the only real reason JJ showed up to that NFL combine was to show off how ripped he's gotten uh, in the month that's passed since the national championship. My guy's been like working overtime hours in the gym. All right. Looking like he can tear through two phone books at the NFL draft combine. Uh, JJ, you're looking very ripped, sir. And uh, I think if anything, the NFL scouts took notice of that this weekend. Yeah. He put on some weight. He absolutely put on some weight. And you know what? His measurables um, back that up. He he appears to be – everybody was saying he was too small or he was not strong enough, not big enough, and all of J.J.'s measurables back it up. And I think that uh, is a question mark, you know, that, that got crossed out at the draft. Uh, Chris Jenkins, the mutant, uh, he had himself a pretty good showing. He did 29 reps on the bench, which was tied uh, for second among defensive tackles. LSU's Jordan Jefferson with 34 reps led all players so far. Keep in mind if you're listening to this, guys, I uh I we don't even I don't believe we even have the offensive line numbers yet. And so we're at the time of this recording, uh there are still some some stats flowing in. So we're just gonna use the stats that we have thus far. So Jordan Jefferson at LSU with 34, Chris Jenkins with 29. Um 
His broad jump was nine foot seven inches, which was fourth among defensive tackles. And his 40 yard dash was pretty impressive. I mean, 4.91 was fifth among all defensive tackles in the combine. And of course, the big boys are not going to be in the sub, you know, the sub four, five, 40 times. They're up closer to the five inch, uh, I'm sorry, five second 40s. And so Chris Jenkins, the mutant NFL father. Uh, NFL pedigree, NFL attitude, NFL body, NFL experience soon to come. Uh, this guy has second or third round written all over him and longtime starter in the NFL. Uh, that's that's basically my assessment. Absolutely. And I did catch some of those uh, offensive line guys um, numbers starting to come in from this afternoon. It looked like Carson Barnhart performed pretty relatively well considering where you know most Michigan fans uh, probably pegged him as being among other Michigan offensive line that linemen that were you know participating in that this weekend Uh, as far as far as his RAS score I believe he scored higher than both Trevor Keegan and Trent A. Jones and uh, Trent A. Jones I think even registered um you know, some of the one one of the faster um, speeds as far as among the three of them. I didn't catch anything on uh, performing in any of those, but did see something from some of those guys. I'll tell you who I was really impressed with yesterday, Mike, and that was Cornelius Johnson, right? A guy that, uh, you know, I think isn't going to be picked very high at all in the draft unless you know some of these scouts and teams are looking primarily at you know these scouting profiles and some of these you know measurables that he's turning in but i think that this is a guy that was severely underutilized during his time with the university of michigan and he's really really going to get a chance to shine with an nfl team that takes a chance on him and whatever round he gets drafted in. I think that he's a legitimate, you know, he was a legitimate wide receiver one option in college that just kind of, you know, had his time divided amongst, you know, with Roman Wilson. So uh, I think that that guy's a rising star. His profile certainly pointed to it yesterday. And I think some team's going to get really lucky when they draft him. I could not agree with you more. I think Cornelius Johnson might be the most underrated player in the draft. And I know, obviously, there's some bias because I'm speaking from a Michigan perspective. But when you cover Michigan as much as we do, you really know the ins and outs of why certain things happen and why certain players didn't amass as big of numbers as they could have. And I think Cornelius Johnson is, uh, he's a lot like JJ McCarthy. He has that run the, run the damn ball syndrome, right? It's like, you're just not going to get as many looks when you're a part of an old school offensive line, smash, smash mouth, run the damn ball, Jim Harbaugh, Sharon Moore system. But you look at him in the draft and across the board, uh, his draft number, I mean, his like, numbers were basically the the same as his stats in college which was really good but not great really good across the board super consistent super crisp he looked confident he didn't you know, he didn't really make any mistakes he was uh very dependable uh above average in all categories right doesn't slip in any area and to me that's that's a guy that is going to make a damn good NFL receiver and I don't even have a problem with the way he was utilized in college. I actually, I mean, I'm not going to complain about a guy that made some of the biggest plays in Michigan football history, right? In the Ohio State game and uh, several other big games. Um, He just didn't amass these like Braylon Edwards numbers because he just wasn't that uh, part, like that focal point of the offense. So I love the call out for Cornelius Johnson. Uh, since we're talking receivers, uh, Roman Wilson seems to be one of the hottest names in the NFL draft as well right now. He ran a 4-3-9-40. Uh, a lot of people actually expected 
a faster 40 time than that. But 439 is pretty damn fast. So Roman's a speedster, uh, and he is probably, I, I think he's moved himself up to the second round. I think it's safe to say that Roman Wilson is a second round draft pick. Yeah, I would be inclined to agree with that, Mike. And, you know, much like like you and Roman himself, I was expecting uh, maybe a, a tad higher of a time from him. And I think he may have expected that from himself just because he's such a threat in that way. But at the end of the day, like all things considered, I believe it was still the fastest time registered by uh, a Michigan Wolverine at the Combine. And, uh, you know, I think that he still has fastest a lot time of this a... year. Yeah. yeah fastest this year. time this, this year. Correct. Because yeah, DJ Turner, DJ Turner burned it last year, man. DJ Turner yeah. set a record last year, you know, uh, so mm. certainly nothing taken away from that. But I think Roman had a little bit, uh, a little bit higher of a uh, expectation for himself other than that. But at the end of the day, you're right. Still a great time. I think that uh, I don't want to say he dinged himself at all because he still has a lot of eyeballs on him going into the NFL draft. I just think that he probably didn't show everything that he has uh, stored away in the cabinet at this combine. But still, I think that it doesn't really do much to hurt his draft stock in any way. I think that he's still looked at as one of the top threats as a wide receiving option in this year's draft. Yeah, agreed. Did you catch uh, Xavier Worthy? Xavier Worthy, he came out there and uh, set the all-time uh, fastest speed ever for any player at the NFL Draft Combine. And, of course, Xavier Worthy was a former Michigan football commit. And after setting the record, who runs up to celebrate with him? None other than uh, J.J. McCarthy and Roman Wilson, That you know, guys that were recruited out of the same class to go I think they were in the same class, around the same class, around the same time, recruited to Michigan at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Xavier Worthy, he's looking like a prime prospect heading into NFL draft time. So, you know, happy for him and everything that uh, that he's done. Even though he couldn't end up with the maize and blue, you know, he's uh, done some great things and no love lost on Michigan's judgment, right? And their eye for uh, spectacular playmakers because Worthy, he was lighting it up yesterday. Absolutely, man. Uh, let's talk about Blake Corum. Blake Corum, 40-yard uh, dash was a, a four five three, which is respectable. But we all know that Blake Corum's not – it's not like the 40-yard dash speed – that makes him so special. We actually got to see what makes him so special when they did the little overlay with some other guys on like the actual drills. And you see he's football fast, you know, football fast. When you got a ball in your hand and you're juking, it's very different than 40 yard fast. And so while his 40 yard dash was respectable, um, we got to see what makes him so special in some of the drills. And then man, 27 reps on the bench. He led all running backs in the at the draft combine which doesn't really surprise me the dude is stacked even when you they when they showed him standing with the group of running backs and you look at Blake Corum like he just pops man he just stands out he's just different that he's just built different and there's going to be a really lucky NFL team that grabs him uh maybe as late as you know middle of the third round uh, I don't think he's going to fall to the fourth round, though, but we'll see. He's going to be right around that late second, early third if, is, is kind of my estimation. Definitely. And, you know, for anybody that's wondering that's not up to speed with Blake Corum's game, you know, Blake Corum is he's just a flat out college football athlete, right? You know, some of these numbers that you see whenever you stack him up against other running backs and where they landed in just terms of pure combine numbers versus Blake Corum, it's really not in indicative of the talent that you get with somebody like Blake Corum just because he possesses so much of an ability just to make plays with his strength, with his shiftiness. He's just a gamer. You know what I mean? You put him out there. 
he's one of the best guys on the field, you know, no matter where he's at or what he's doing. So I, I'd look at this kind of stuff, and it's almost – I don't want to say that he shouldn't have participated in the combine or anything like that, but you know, I I think that uh, he, for what you did see him grade highly on, you know, you expected it, and from some other things, you know, I think there's nothing you can really take away from him just because of that playmaker ability that he has, just being Blake Corum and doing what he does best with his strength, with his ability to cut and juke people. So I'm really excited. I'd say Blake Corum, probably aside from J.J. McCarthy, is the guy that I'm most excited to see don an NFL helmet. Just because, I mean, he's just a dude, right? I mean, yeah. I, I just can't wait to see him with all of his physicality, with all of his hunger to be great in everything that he does, end up with an NFL team and, and try to make him his way on that team. So he's a guy that I would say watch out for, you know, it seems that, you know, the running back is the most common position where you just kind of forget about it or pawn it off come NFL time, but watch out for Blake Corum come NFL draft day. Well, I'm old enough to remember when Mike Hart got drafted and I, I was such a huge Mike Hart fan. I mean, he was my favorite player for a long, long time and he got drafted to the Indianapolis Colts. And a lot of people said, oh, he never panned out in the NFL. And, and while that's true, a lot of people don't remember how that played out. So Mike Hart finally got a chance to step up for the Colts. And he had a 100-yard rushing game and the game-winning touchdown. And then he blew out his knee, and he never recovered from that knee injury. And so I've always been like, man, I wish I could have seen Mike Hart uh, you know, in that little zone run game, zone blocking run game that the Colts had that Michigan also had. And, and like, I thought he would have been the perfect little uh, between the tackles, like bowling ball kind of running back that could have had a long, great career. And it just never panned out. And so Blake Corum is like Mike Hart 2.0. And I'm so excited that we get to see him in the NFL. I pray that he stays healthy because that's that's the big thing with running backs, right? You got to stay healthy. Um, he could be a, just a fantastic, fantastic running back in the NFL. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. Um, Mike Sanders still. Let's talk about Mike Sanders still. I thought all around he had a really strong performance. His 20-yard shuttle time was second among all DBs at uh, 4.01 seconds. And uh, some of his other measurables, you know, he – He's a smaller guy, so he's not, you know, he's not going to tear up the bench press or anything like that. And so, it, again, and I think NFL scouts know this. You got to know what you're looking at. Like the the dude's a gamer. He's a ball ma ball player. The NFL, I'm sorry, the college football game tape is what's going to show people what Mike Sanders still is made of. But I thought he had a really solid uh, performance at the combine. Agreed. I think that he is a guy that continues to draw eyeballs the longer that this yeah. offseason process continues to play out um you know he's just doing all the right things he had the the exact type of college football season that he needed to have this year and i think that it's you're looking at a situation where you could have been looking at one time a undrafted free agent or you know like sixth, seventh round pick to, you know, Mike Sainer still could be somebody that's taken, you know, in a reasonable period of time in the NFL draft, you know? So I'll be really excited to see that if it comes to fruition. I've said this before, and I took a lot of heat for this because um, I know he's, you know, maybe a third or fourth round guy. But if I got the 32nd pick in the NFL draft, right, last pick of the first round, and Mike Sanders still falls to my, you know, in my lap, I'm taking him. You know, I'm I, there's there are not 30 dudes in the in this NFL draft that are better football players than Mike Sanders still. As a matter of fact, there's probably not even 10 guys in this draft that are better football players than Mike Sanders still. And I understand why he's not a top 10 or top 15 pick. I mean, he's five foot nine and three quarters, right? Like the, he's kind of small. He's not, not the biggest guy in the world, but 
at the end of the day, I think every now and then a player comes along where size just doesn't matter. The thing that matters is does he know the game? Does he perform at the game? Does he execute? And Mike Sanders still is all of those things. Um, I I really think he's going to be a long time uh, Pro Bowl caliber player because he's just that good of a football player. Um, anybody else you want to touch on? Josh Wallace and AJ Barner. We saw a little bit of them, both solid guys. AJ Barner could actually be a guy that's better in the pros than college, right? He kind he kind of has that feel about him, right? Is that he's going to really bloom in the pros? Um, yeah. Anybody else you want I to think touch so. on? I think that uh, that he was a guy all season long that you know drew rave numbers from aggregates like pff uh, yeah. things like that for his ability to run block and i think when called upon you know he did everything that he was asked to do from michigan offensively so i think you know you're probably seeing something of a luke schoonmaker type situation taking place with aj barner where you know he maybe gets gets taken in the top three rounds or something like that just because of his ability to be perceived as that prototypical tight end that is excellent in the run blocking game but can also be lethal offensively i wouldn't be surprised to see him get taken in that range yeah i agree and then josh wallace another transfer that uh you know popped over from umass contributed in a in a pretty special way on a national championship team and uh i would not be surprised if he goes you know maybe sixth or seventh round you know that i think the goal with josh wallace is to just get him off the board so he doesn't have to be an undrafted free agent and um i think he's good enough i, I think he's good enough i think somebody will consider uh taking him that late uh in other news ronald bellamy uh, our wide receivers coach receives a new contract and a new role as the passing game coordinator. I don't. I didn't dig too deep into that story. I don't have any uh, details. Do you have the details on that at all? Yeah. So uh, it's a two-year extension, to my knowledge, and um, it does come with a pay raise, as you've already alluded to, um, in addition to an increased role as the passing game coordinator taking over the uh, the former duties of uh, Kirk Campbell, if I'm not mistaken. I believe Kirk had, had a, a lot of the control over that over the previous season. Now that he's the offensive coordinator, uh, Kirk will be stepping into kind of a larger scale umbrella. So uh, that now goes to Ron Bellamy, which, you know, I love to see it, right? Because Ron Bellamy is a guy that has deep ties with uh, a lot of the guys on Michigan's current roster, uh, Samaj Morgan, um, Makari Page, Donovan Edwards, all come from West Bloomfield, where he was plucked from as a head coach a couple years ago. So I love that they secured him. I think it's great for the culture that you have in place with the current roster and players that you have in place. And it's also huge for recruiting. That's another thing that's kind of overlooked a little bit. Um, just because he has such a solid footprint locally, not just with West Bloomfield, but with the University of Michigan. Uh, Ron Bellamy, obviously an alum of the University of Michigan. So I think that this is probably one of the more underrated moves of the offseason, just because, you know, it, it was probably looked upon as you know one of the likeliest things to happen in terms of the coaching staff but i think that uh that sharon moore's ability to secure bellamy on a deal that puts him in ann arbor for at least a couple more years is huge so uh i was really excited to see it happen yeah it's it's cool to see all of these player coaches you know former michigan players sticking around i mean it 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 feels like uh, with Grant Newsom and Ronald Bellamy, hopefully Mike Hart, uh, Denard Robinson, keeping those guys around is really important. It's one of my favorite things that Jim Harbaugh did. Uh, Mike Elston. Oh, wait. Same. Fuck. Mike Elston's gone. Never mind. But you know what I'm saying. It's one of my favorite things that uh, Turncoat Harbaugh bastard. did. 
Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, that about does it for today. But I want to provide our listeners with an amazing opportunity. Uh, as a reminder, the Smash t-shirts are live on wolverinechronicle.com. Sharon Moore rallies the troops of the Michigan football team with one simple word, Smash Go to wolverinechronicle.com slash shop and get your Smash t-shirts today. And the opportunity that I'm giving to our listeners is to get 20% off. Use code BHB20 to get 20% off. That's for Big House Bleachers, BHB20. Or uh, you can can find it at wolverinechronicle.com slash shop or just click the link in the description for 20% off. Um, All right, Matt. Have a good week, my friend. I still, still, uh, baby Woodson still isn't here, man. We, we thought he was coming last week. Still isn't here. Uh, my wife is, uh, having those contractions that kind of start to happen before the labor. So I, it's a, hey, we're, we're getting there, man. Any day now. Hell yeah, buddy. Well, I wish you well over the next week, you know, it, having not happened this weekend, I would have to think that only increases the likelihood that, uh, that that new baby to the smelter household will be coming any day now, my friend. So best of luck to you, buddy. Yeah, you don't have to be a doctor or a scientist to know that a pregnant woman, <laughs> every day that goes by, I, I mean, I guess the odds increase that that little baby's going to pop out eventually, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, I think we'll have another another member of the smelter family soon. Um, I'll let you know this week how that all pans out. And of course I'll share it on social media with all of our followers. I'm always really grateful when, uh, all of our followers get to get to see what's going on with our families as well. That does it for this week. That was the big house bleachers podcast. That's Matt Hartwell. I'm Michael Smeltzer as always go blue, go blue.